Good morning, Valley View. Good morning. What a wonderful summer, spring. I don't know which season exactly, but it feels a little bit like summer these last couple of days. What a beautiful weekend we've had, and it's a joy to be here together and to worship God. And we're looking forward to a great, great celebration next week. So we want to encourage you, if you would, to take some of the invitations that have been printed and prepared. They're on the center table back in the foyer. And hand those out to friends, family. You can mail them. They're, they're, they're return addressed on the back. So we want to make sure that we celebrate and we share this great 10 years that this church has experienced with friends, family, and all of those that we know. So please take a moment to do that, if you will. You know, I, I, there's things that all of us are good at. And there's other things that where we could improve, I guess you might say. And one of the areas in life where I, I rely upon my wife and daughters is in the area of fashion. I am not very skilled when it comes to fashion. Part of the problem is I am stone cold colorblind. Now I see the world in pure color, but it's just not the same color as everybody else. So it can be problematic when I think purple is blue and so forth and so on when it comes to matching things. So I try to rely on Miss Lenora when it's not early service and she's not too tired to help me. But just when it comes to fashion, I don't, I don't understand it. Because the ties that people wear now, you know, those big broad striped ties that are in fashion, those are what my dad was wearing in the 70s. And I think, why couldn't I just have saved all my daddy's ties from 1974 and, you know, still be wearing them today? Why? That doesn't make any sense to me. How things will go out and no one will want them and then give it 30 years and they're right back and everybody wants them again. The one that's remarkable to me is the fact that young men now wear these short shorts like we used to wear playing basketball in the late 70s and early 80s. You remember that? Those really short basketball shorts? Well, now they wear those as just everyday wear to school. They call them chubbies. I don't know why they're called that. I suppose that's a name brand. But I look at that and I think, that's just why. Why do you want to go back to that? That went out years and years ago. Because some things are fashionable and then they become unfashionable and then they become fashionable again. Well, as we discuss our topic this morning, we're going to address something that has become in many ways unfashionable in our society. But you know, sometimes because things have become unfashionable or unpopular, really doesn't have any bearing on their value and their worth. It has become unfashionable to do what you have engaged in this very morning. To get up and to get dressed and to come and attend and believe that coming to church, that being a part of a church has a positive effect upon your life. Church, in and of itself, has become extremely unfashionable, has it not? In fact, it's intriguing to me that they tell us spirituality, especially among the postmoderns and the millennials, that spirituality is on the rise. We have some of the most spiritual generations that have ever existed in American society. Yet among those groups, church attendance is the lowest that it has ever been. And now folks from my generation, and most of you seated here today, that is kind of an oxymoron. That's a paradox that doesn't have a solution. How can you be spiritual but be resistant to church? And I think part of the problem, and there's a lot of factors that go into this, but I think part of the problem is it has been allowed for people to have two trains of thought that separate the idea of religious from the idea of spiritual. Because we see people that abuse religion. We see through the years that in the name of religion, so many things that are certainly unspiritual and certainly ungodly have been accomplished. And we look at that and we say, well, then therefore religion, that must not have anything to do with being truly spiritual. You know, that would be like saying that Look at all these failed marriages. Marriage must have nothing to do with being in love. Of course, we wouldn't make that assertion because simply because some 
of those relationships don't succeed doesn't invalidate the power and the meaning of the relationship itself. And so as we look and consider all that this means, we examine the church, the principle of the church from Scripture. And we ask, what does the Bible say about whether or not this institution, I don't mean this building, I mean this gathering of people. What does the Bible say about the importance of the church? We look first of all in Acts chapter 2. 38-39. If you're going to talk about any subject, it's probably best to go back to the beginning. And we find the roots of the church of our Lord here in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Christ, of course, has died, been resurrected. He is now ascended. And here on this feast of Pentecost, His uh, disciples have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues and to prophesy and to preach. And Peter stands up before a great multitude. And he talks about how Jesus was indeed the Son of God. He was indeed the Messiah that they had waited for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. But then he closes in verse 36 with, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so he closes out with a very strong invitation, if you will. As he says to them, all these prophecies that have led up to your Messiah, to your King, your King finally came. God made him Lord in Christ and you killed him. Well, it's no surprise the reaction of the crowd. Because it says in verse 37, and they were pierced to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do? And Peter replied, verse 38, Repent and be baptized every single one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what I think is very intriguing is the next few verses. Because he says, And this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord your God will call. Now what's intriguing is he's telling us that, that what, all the events of this day, all this salvation, and all this hope from hopelessness that is being offered to them is something that will be offered well into the future. In fact, he says this promise is for them, for their children, for all who are far off, in essence, for everyone forevermore. But what is that promise? What are the results? Look at verses 41 through 47. Acts chapter 2. In verse 41, it tells us, Then those who gladly received His word were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And then we skip over to verse 47. And praising God and having favor with all the people, then the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, what's interesting is the church didn't exist before those 3,000 were baptized. They are the beginning. They're the root. They're the seed of the church, if you will. They're baptized. They become the church. Now he says more and more are coming to him day by day. And they're added to that church. What I want to explain and what we have to see is there are two principles here that are inseparable. The first is the principle of relationship with God, salvation, forgiveness of sins, however you want to describe it. And the second is the church. Because he says those who were being saved were added to the church. They happen simultaneously. It is one event. It is one process. It is inseparable. Being saved, being added to the church are the same thing. And he says this very promise, this event that takes place is what will be offered to everyone for all time, forevermore. And folks, that means, whether it's fashionable or not, that means in 2014 as much as it did in AD 30. The promise of God 
is interwrapped with the principle of his church. You see, Peter felt that the church, the kingdom, would endure and be among the greatest of blessings for people. And undoubtedly, he remembered the words of Jesus back in Matthew chapter 16. You'll remember that. Where Peter responded to Christ's question, Who am I? He said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus responds, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For this has not been revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father which art in heaven. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever such things as you bind on earth will be bound on heaven, and whichever such things as you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So there he says, this principle that I am the Son of God, the Savior of the world, he says, this will build the church. So there he ties the identity of who Jesus is, that he is Savior, with the fact that the way we respond to the fact that he is Savior is in the context of the church. And that church is indeed on earth the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. No doubt Peter remembered back to that moment as he preached his first sermon and he saw that promise of Jesus come to fulfillment for the first time. With such a truth so evident, why do you think it is that some continue to assault the relevance of the Lord's church in our time? I think part of it has to do with numbers. There's a reality that right now in the churches of Christ, we are like many other of our religious neighbors have suffered a decline in attendance. 35 to 40 years ago, the Churches of Christ had an excess of 2.2 million in services. We call those adherents, people who constantly come to church every Sunday. Right now, it's about half that. Somewhere between 950,000 and 1.1 million. So we have declined as far as in the adherence of folks who actually come and attend church. And that's not just true for Churches of Christ. That's true across the religious world. Especially in American culture. European, it's even worse. And so what's intriguing about that is how people respond to that reality. Now, I'm suggesting to you today that Satan has done a good job with separating in the minds of people in our world the idea of the church and spirituality. He's used it to separate and divide those principles so that people think they can have a relationship with God apart from having a relationship with God's people. But that's not how many Christians approach those numbers. In fact, as a result of those numbers, many would attack the church itself. Countless brethren who once upheld and defended the church now call her outdated and irrelevant. So their solution to why it is that people don't come to that which Jesus designed and Jesus instituted and that Satan wants us to destroy and to dismantle is to try to destroy and dismantle it. It doesn't make any sense, but that's the result. Others say that the church holds no benefit to modern man, so therefore she must be modified. She must be made culturally relevant. Now it, I guess it doesn't affect the argument that the church has always been the church in every culture that's existed for the last 2,000 years. But yet now, the solution is to make her more culturally relevant. And still others would say that the very principles about which the church are founded are barriers to evangelism. They're what keeps her from growing. Now I find this one amazing. Because here in Acts chapter 2, what does Peter say they need to do to be a part of the church and to be saved? They say, what must we do? We crucified our God, our Savior, our Lord. Peter says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ will be of your sins. But what's interesting is that many today, even in our own midst, not at Valley View, but I mean in the churches of Christ, would say, well, baptism, we don't need to talk about that as firmly, as, as strongly as we have, because that could be a barrier to people. How can it be a barrier if it is that very thing Peter first prescribed in response to their sin? 
and to be a part of the church and to be a part of Christ and to be forgiven and to receive the Holy Spirit. How can that be a barrier? But yet there are those who say that the separation of spirituality in the church, the solution is to, you know, change the message of what the church is all about. It's intriguing. It's very discouraging. And I think what must happen is, as God's people, we must be convicted. We must be those who know and believe with all of our hearts, not only in the importance of, of course, our relationship with Christ, but from a biblical perspective, understand the importance of the church. Understand the importance of the church. You know, it's interesting to me, this concept that we can be a part of, the, of God and be a Christian and be, have a relationship with Him and not be a part of the church, which is made up of Christians. You know, back at, the, at my children's school back in Alabama, private school, they had a big grandparents day once a year. And it drew just huge crowds because grandparents from both sides of the family would come and, you know, they would honor these grandparents. And a lot of times they would have the band would play all of the different service anthems, you know, from whatever the words are, I'm not a Marine, so I don't know. But they play that and then they play the Army and they play the Navy and they play the, what's the other Army name, Air Force, and then they'd even play the Coast Guard. They didn't want to leave anybody out. And, you know, they would honor, they would ask all the grandparents who served in the military, all the grandparents who were soldiers, to stand up. And they would stand up. Now, imagine this. You've been to events like that where folks would stand up. If you've ever been a soldier, stand up. I won't ask you to this morning, but have you ever been to an event like that? And imagine that there were people all around you who started standing up. And you knew for a fact they had never been in any branch of the armed services. Would that be bothersome to you? Wouldn't it be? You'd be like, well, what are you doing? I'm a soldier. You know, I, I teach karate. I've done karate for years and years. And, you know, it's kind of like a combat thing. Maybe I could call myself a soldier. Would that be okay? Would you think that'd be appropriate for me to stand up when they honor veterans and soldiers and to stand up, even though I've never served in the military, to stand up and say, well, I'm a soldier. No, you're not a soldier. What branch of the military did you serve? I didn't. But I'm a soldier. You know, I do the things like a soldier. I think like a soldier. You see, we would never allow that. It would offend us in our core because to be a soldier, the definition of a soldier is you have to serve in the organization. It's what defines you as a soldier. And you may do all the same things as a soldier. You know, one of these uh, mercenaries or some of these government contract soldiers, they're not veterans. Well, they carry a gun. And they wear a flak jacket. But they're not a veteran. Because you can't be a veteran. You can't really be a soldier. If you're not a part of the organization. Right? It is the definition. And folks, this is not to be ugly. It's not to be hard or, or insensitive. But there's a lot of folks today who believe they have a relationship with God. Who believe that they are Christians, if you will. But they've never been and never intend to be a part of the church. You can't have a relationship with God. Outside of the organization. Well, a better word for the church would be the organism of the church. It has always been that way. It will always be that way. And Satan will always want to confuse the issue. Just a couple of quick things to share as we close. Number one, the teaching of salvation in the church and scripture are inseparable. They cannot be separated. In Acts 2.47, it 
says, praising God and having favor with all the people. This is again in the context of that very first conversion of those who would be the church. Praising God and having favor with all the people. The Lord asked the church daily, added to the church daily, those who were being saved. When you're saved, you're added to the church. When you're added to the church, you're saved. If you're not added to the church, you're not saved. And if you're not saved, you're not added to the church. They cannot be separated. They are one in the same. Symbiotic in Scripture. John 3, 3 and 5, Jesus said, Lest a man be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Lest you be born of the water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And there in Matthew 16, what did Jesus tell Peter was a synonym of the kingdom of heaven. Remember, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Church and kingdom can be used synonymously. They're the same thing. Lest a man be born again, cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. If a person's a born again Christian, if their sins are washed away, if they're a new person in Christ, they are in the church. And if they're in the church, guess what? They're a born again Christian. You cannot separate those two principles. Secondly, the church is the very source of truth in a world ruled by the father of lies. It's no wonder that Satan tells a lie about the church. Because the church is mankind's only defense against his lies. We're not making that up. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. Where Paul writes and he says, I write this to you so that you know yourself how to conduct yourself in the church of God, which is the, the, which is the house of God, the pillar of and the support of what? The truth. The pillar and support of the truth. We can look over in Romans chapter 10, 13 through 15, and you know that text, where he says, How can they hear if they with how can they hear unless one is sent? How can they hear without a preacher? And we ask the question: what is the message is the bringer, the sender bringing? The doctrine of whoever sent him. The only missionaries that will ever go into the world are the ones who are sent by the church. And without those messages, the scriptures say people cannot be saved. The church is the very source of truth. Now Jesus, of course, is the truth. But God's design is that truth is spread in the world through the church. Thirdly, Christ's endearment for man is directed through the church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, it says this. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you as one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Over and over in the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Acts 20, 28 teaches us this same principle. Why did Jesus die on the cross? We say he died on the cross for me. Yes, but that's not the whole of the answer. Jesus died on the cross to buy the church. To purchase the church. But yet there are those today who diminish the importance of the church. Let me tell you, don't tell me you love me. And diminish the importance of Lenora Williams. Because we're going to have problems. Because my bride is my everything. Isn't that how it's supposed to be? And you know, most of us fellas, we can handle people criticizing us, right? But... Her? I mean, that, we get, that's important. The bride. How important is your bride? But yet there are those who say they love Jesus and run down the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Better be careful. Because over and over and over in the New Testament, the church is referred to as the bride. And I know how a man who loves his wife so much he gives very life for. I know how we feel about our bride. 
How can anybody say they love Jesus and don't love his bride? And don't honor his bride? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You see, the church is relevant today. That's why Satan wants people to believe that it's not. Isn't it? It is relevant. It has power against the forces of evil. It is the support of truth. It is that place where salvation can be found. It is that through which Christ pours out His love for mankind. So I ask you this this morning. I think there are two groups to which this lesson will particularly apply. First of all, those who have maybe lost some of their zeal, some of their passion for the church. I know you're here today and Sunday morning and there could be at least some minimal level of commitment, but how is your commitment? How is your love for? How is your devotion to the church? Did you need this reminder this morning of how essential this group of people really are? But the second message is for those who You've not yet become a part of the church. And maybe you've felt that you had a relationship with God, but, you know, the religion thing is too much. This has not been intended to be hard. It's not been intended to be insulting, but it is intended to cause you to think. Because it cannot be denied that any thoughts that dictate that the church and faith or spirituality can be separated are not from God. They are from the devil. It is a lie. All who are saved must be part of the church. And all who are part of the church are those who are saved. You need to come to Christ Jesus and be born again to be added to the church. Or if you need to renew your commitment to the church, whatever it may be, come right now as we stand.